Thank you all for your patience. Uh, I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to this joint seminar of the uh, Department of Political and Social Change, uh, as well as the ANU Philippines Project. Um, um, it's a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Julio Tihanki, uh, who is a professor at uh, De La Salle University uh, in uh, Manila, and uh, someone that uh, is well known as a leading political analyst uh, in the Philippines. Uh, July has worked with uh, Ed Aspinall and I uh, on Money Politics Project, and uh, July and I have known each other for, for a very long time, and it's great to have him here on the Visiting Fellowship Program of the um, ANU Philippines Project. Um, <coughs> just a couple other things so we can get started quickly. I might note that he's a former dean of uh, liberal arts at uh, De La Salle University, and he is the outgoing president of the Philippine Political Science Association, I'm getting there, and the incoming uh, president is right here, uh, Dr. Rosalie Hall, uh, and uh, Rosalie is also here as a visiting fellow uh, with the ANU Philippines Project. Welcome, Rosalie, as well. So um, I'll turn it over to you, July. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Magandang hapon po sa inyo in Filipino. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you this afternoon. First of all, we'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, uh, the uh, School of uh, Regulation and Glo Global Governance and the uh, Philippines Project, of course, under the uh, uh, leadership of uh, uh, Dr. Imelda Diella, uh, for having me as a visiting fellow. I've been here since uh, early July. Mm -hmm. My nickname is July, but I was born in December. <laughs> it's, a, it's another long story, as long as the narrative of the political dynasties mm -hmm. in the Philippines. But uh, I would like to also thank uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Paul Hutchcroft, uh, for all the support throughout the years, spanning uh, generations. No. For this afternoon, I'd like to present to you uh, uh, a research that I have been uh, conducting uh, for the past two decades or so. Uh, this was the topic of my doctoral dissertation almost 19 years ago. Uh, <laughs> next year, it's going to be two decades. So, uh, and uh, apparently, uh, just like dynasticism, in uh, Philippine politics, it's a topic that keeps going back, no? mm -hmm. coming back. A uh, couple of months back, we just held our uh, midterm elections. And aside from the fact that uh, the mainstream opposition totally lost to the uh, uh, administration uh, party, the other main story is, and which is a continuing narrative in every uh, elections in the Philippines, is that of the continuing dominance of the political dynasties. And uh, I would like to uh, share with you this afternoon my presentation on dynastic cycles, the rise and fall of political families from 19, 1907 to the present. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, I've collected this uh, family album. <laughs> and this, this is the pictures of all the past seven presidents in the Philippines. And uh, as you can see, uh, all the presidents since Ferdinand Marcos have either emerged from a political family or have established political dynasties uh, upon reaching the pinnacle of power. And uh, one of the main stories of the midterm elections of uh, 2019 is that of the politics of Era Pestrada. Era Pestrada, as most of you who are in, uh, familiar with the uh, 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 politics of the Philippines, is the prototypical populist. In fact, he is the first real populist politician in the uh, Philippines. A very popular movie actor who parlayed on his uh, popularity to first run as mayor of the small town of San Juan uh, close to 50 years ago and uh, almost 50, no, 50 years ago and uh, uh, rose up uh, the political ladder to become senator 
then vice president, then president, then was ousted uh, in the second people power uh, revolution in the Philippines, uh, made the comeback, uh, came in second to Noy Noy Aquino in the 2010 uh, presidential election, and eventually uh, ran for uh, the mayorship of the premier city of the Philippines, the capital of Manila. And he was re-elected. But uh, in this year's midterm election, he expanded his power base from the local to the national and then back to the local. So from his uh, original bailiwick of San Juan, he moved to uh, uh, Manila. So he was in control of both uh, Manila and San Juan, plus he has a branch uh, at the national level. Uh, of course, some would uh, say that all of the different branches of the political dynasties, a dynasty corresponded with his uh, different uh, partners. Uh, so, so what was the story? The story is that the bigger, the biggest shock of this year's midterm election was Estrada and all of his relatives who ran in both national and local positions all lost. No? And for the first time in 50 years, the Estradas have lost even in their bailiwick of San Juan. So this was the one of the biggest news of the 2019 Philippine midterm election. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm sure there is. <laughs> 32 candidates from different political clans also <coughs> lost in this year's election. So some, like for example, uh, the Estradas after 50 years, uh, the Eusebios of Pasig City after 20 years, the Duranos after 34 years, no? lost. Uh, Plaza from, uh, from Mindanao, from... Uh, Butuan, Butuan no? lost after 21 years. Emano, uh, Cagayan de Oro after 37 years. The, the Florendo Lagdameo clan in Mindanao also 34 years. The Ecleos, no? uh, uh, this, this is uh, the political family that emerged from a religious cult which was in control of a Dinagat. isolated island of Dinagat. Uh, uh, lost after 12 years in power. So one would think there is an emerging trend. Uh, there's an emerging trend of uh, dynasties losing. And another story is that of the emergence of the next generation of local leaders, uh, progressive local leaders uh, with uh, more uh, uh, good governance uh, narrative uh, with a more modernist outlook in their uh, leadership style. So for example, uh, the young Vico Soto, a graduate of the Ateneo School of Government, uh, defeated the Eusebio clan in Pasig. Uh, Francis Samora, a graduate of political science at De La Salle University, <laughs> my former student, <laughs> defeated uh, uh, the daughter of uh, uh, Senator Jingoy Estrada for mayor. And then Kaka Bagao, a human rights activist and civil society uh, uh, activist, also a graduate of De La Salle University, by the way, <laughs> uh, <coughs> defeated uh, the Ecleos in Dinagat Island, not once, but twice. No? Mm -hmm. First in Congress, then now as governor. Mm -hmm. And then Roland Paulino Jr., uh, a young lawyer, I think he's from UP. Mm -hmm. No, he's, at, he's from Ateneo also. So you're, you're seeing a pattern here. <laughs> so uh, uh, Ateneo uh, defeated the Gordons of Olongapo. Mm -hmm. huh? So again, uh, it seems that there is some good news no? amidst all, all, all of this bad news coming out of the Philippines, at least from the perspective of uh, uh, those living outside the Philippines. They, they always hear a lot of bad news. There seems to be some silver lining. But 
these are only a sampling mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the emerging next generation. Except for, and of course, the, the darling of Philippine social media now uh, is Co Moreno, uh, formerly uh, an extremely uh, poor uh, uh, young man who grew up in the dumps of Manila, uh, became a movie actor, then just like movie, so most of the movie actors in the Philippines, uh, went into politics, uh, first as councillor, then later on uh, as vice mayor of Manila, twice, uh, and then now he's the mayor of Manila, and he's now the darling of uh, social media because in his first week, he cleaned up uh, most of the streets of Manila, and he's trying to put back order in the streets of Manila. And he has astutely utilized social media every time uh, he goes around, he, he goes on Facebook Live. No? So now, <laughs> he's the, he's the, uh, uh, the new uh, politician for the uh, new era of the millennials and social media users. But looking at all of these five uh, young leaders, except for Kaka Bagao and Isko Moreno, all this, the rest, no, the three others, are members of political dynasties themselves. Mm. No? So, Biko Soto comes from a, a, an old political family. His uh, uncle is now the Senate president. He's also the son of a very popular comedian, uh, a host of a, the, one of the longest running, if not the longest running noontime variety show in the Philippines. Uh, Francis Zamora is the son of a uh, formerly very close political ally of Joseph Estrada. In fact, his father, uh, Ronnie Zamora, used to be the executive secretary of Joseph Estrada when he was president. And uh, uh, Roland Paulino Jr. is the son of the former mayor of Olongapo. So they're still part of the same old uh, political dynasty. Now, if 32 families lost, there are still 319 more. So there are 319 <laughs> political families have controlled local and national politics based on my count. And uh, 234 continue to dominate until the midterm election. So if we subtract 32, there are still, uh, what, 200 plus, not 202. Uh, and uh, of the political families that fielded uh, candidates in, uh, in the 2019, 220 have held local positions for at least two decades on the average, okay? Uh, there's some more bad news. The average dynastic share based on the study conducted by the Ateneo School of Government, uh, the trend is that 81% of governors are, uh, come from political families, 78% of congressmen, 69% of mayors, and 57% of vice mayors. Uh, by 2040, 70% of the local government officials will be dynastic. I think we have the highest rate of growth of uh, political dynasties in the world. Uh, uh, this phenomenon of uh, uh, political families uh, dominating politics can also be observed in other countries. Now, they also have this in Japan and in other parts of uh, uh, Southeast Asia. No? But I think uh, the Philippines has the most number of political dynasties. Uh, Political families uh, have always been a, an enduring feature of Philippine politics. It is said that uh, political clans, not parties, have been the building blocks of Philippine elections. And I always share uh, to my students that uh, Philippine elections is nothing but a clash of clans. No? Uh, and uh, when, we, when I use the term political dynasty, I refer to the concentration, consolidation, or perpetuation of political power in persons related to one another. Uh, one 
very useful uh, categorization was also uh, provided by uh, my good friend Dean Ronald Mendoza of the Ateneo School of Government. Uh, he distinguished between tin dynasties and fat dynasties. No? Uh, <laughs> tin dynasties are dynasties in the traditional sense. Uh, the father or the mother passing the position through election uh, to the next uh, generation. So from Juan to Pedro. Uh, so the more toxic form of uh, dynasticism in the Philippines and uh, it's become uh, widespread in the past few decades is what we call the fat dynasty in which different members of the same political clan or political family uh, occupy several elected and even appointed position in a particular constituency or province. And this is the more toxic uh, manifestation of political dynasticism in the Philippines. Uh, in my research, now this has been a very useful uh, uh, categorization of uh, political dynasties, but uh, it only gives us a snapshot of uh, a particular point in time uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, determining the number of political dynasties in a particular uh, uh, constituency. The point of my research is to introduce or reintroduce a more historical approach to the study of dynasticism. Thank you. And uh, I, I propose the following categorization. So just like blood types, no? <laughs> type A, type B, type C, type D. Uh, my first categorization is type A durable. This refers to dominant political families that have been active in local and national politics for more than 50 years since the period of colonial and post-colonial state building, okay? So durable. Now, they have been there since the very beginning. Uh, dominant, I refer to uh, recently dominant families that rose to power during 14 years of authoritarian rule under Ferdinand Marcos and or within more than 30 years of redemocratization. Re then you have dormant, previously dominant political families that suffer from electoral defeat but still retain the political resources and machinery to make a comeback. So they may lose an election, but they still maintain some influence or they still hold some lower minor uh, position in government so that they can use it for another bid at capturing power. And then you have defunct. Political families that have lost a series of elections and have completely disappeared from the electoral arena with the collapse of their local machinery and support base. So these are families that, that have totally disappeared. There's still a chance that they might come back, but it's slim uh, because the next generation have decided to move on to other profession, okay? So notice that uh, the first two uh, categories are more or less referring to the strength, uh, uh, longevity of a uh, uh, political dynasty. Uh, uh, and then the other two refers to uh, the capacity to come back or to maintain their machinery. So this is time, this is capacity. Okay. So I looked at all the uh, political dynasties, I reviewed uh, and the past four weeks, all I've done was to count dynasties. <laughs> so since it's winter, there's nothing much to do but <laughs> stay in my flat and count dynasties. Wow. What a way to spend my sabbatical. <laughs> okay. So uh, from the colonial period, no, because uh, um, a little background on uh, elite uh, building in the Philippines, uh, 
when the Spaniards arrived uh, more than 400 years ago, uh, they utilized the local notables to, to run the local affairs, to collect taxes, to maintain order in the colony. Uh, they've experimented with elections, but they did not really institutionalize elections until the Americans came and introduced democracy. And the very first thing that the American did was to hold elections, or at least appoint uh, local executives uh, beginning uh, in the 1900s. No? And then they started building uh, uh, the uh, colonial state from the bottom up. And, uh, and uh, they first started with the uh, munis municipalities, towns, uh, then later on the provincial governors, and then they held election for the first uh, National Assembly. Uh, but the problem was uh, the Americans introduced elections before uh, consolidating uh, central bureaucracy. They introduced parties before uh, uh, mass movements can really uh, uh, consolidate into real coherent parties. So uh, from the outset, uh, Philippine political parties have always been vehicles for receiving and distributing patronage from above, from central Manila, okay, or what we call Imperial Manila. So uh, most of these local notables were able to uh, use that route to uh, gain uh, resources from the national, distribute it to the local, and national leaders have depended depended uh, on the uh, support of the locals through the dispensation of uh, patronage. So during the first two uh, eras of Philippine uh, political history, uh, those who participated in Philippine elections were from the landed elite. But it was uh, during the post-war era with the transformation of the uh, political economy and urbanization and the rise of new professional uh, individuals who entered politics, the, uh, the hold of the traditional landed elite uh, uh, was diminished. But at that time, Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law and ruled as a dictator for 40 years until the fall of the Marcos dictatorship. So using this uh, uh, timeline, uh, different political families have managed to maintain mm -hmm. no, their hold on national and local power, uh, either consolidating their local, then using it to gain national power, or using their national po power to uh, get a foothold at the local. So they were able to ride the ebbs and flow of, of these different political regimes. Uh, dom the dominant clans or political families that exist uh, that are uh, dominant right now, uh, most of them emerged from the 14 years of the Marcos dictatorship and another part uh, emerged recently, more recently, after the fall of Marcos. Uh, of course, you have the dormant. Uh, they either emerged during the post-war or the authoritarian, but they're no longer active. And then you have the defunct. Okay, again, based on my count, my initial count, uh, I still have to do a recount. Uh, I counted the governors and those who were elected at the Senate and those who were elected as members of the House of Representatives since 1901. But a large part of my data set is still missing, and that is the mayors and the board members and the city councilors. So that will take another year or so. So this is a long-term project. So uh, I, I want to really see if there's a trend. But based on my initial count, 35% uh, uh, of political families have been active since the colonial and post-war period. So 
a significant number. No? Still, it's been there since the American colonial period, or at least the post-war period. And then you have 39% of political families have emerged only during the last uh, four decades. And 26% of political families are either dormant or defunct. So yeah, dynasties do die, but only a handful. Huh? Only a handful. So there's really something going on there. There's something wrong with the system. Uh, so I'll give you some uh, profiles of some of these dynasties. Uh, the longest running dynasty, the Ortega clan, has dominated the political life of uh, La Union province is a province in the north of Luzon, in the Philippines, and they have dominated all the positions for more than 100 years. No? So they're on their 115th or 120th year. Uh, their hold on power started when the family patriarch Don Joaquin Ortega was first appointed governor of the province in 1901. Okay. And then became, and since then, uh, his, uh, his children have dominated the politics. Francisco became governor, mayor, a uh, member of the House of Representatives in the post-war. Then during the authoritarian per period, another son, Joaquin, no, uh, was active in the post-EDSA, post-Marcos period, Victor, Manuel, and down to their third, fourth, fifth generation, down to the lowest level in Philippine, uh, in the Philippine uh, uh, politics, uh, the barangay or the uh, barrio level. No? And uh, but the only thing worth <coughs> noting about the Ortega was that they managed to maintain their dominance only up until the provincial level. They have never attempted to breach national. And I think that was uh, one key to their longevity. So they were content with just be, you know, being uh, clients to national patrons. Uh, so from all the presidents in the post-war to Marcos and all the presidents in the post-authoritarian period. Okay, so that's the key to their durability. Uh, dominant, interesting case, no? Uh, Rodrigo Duterte, the Duterte clan, no? And uh, uh, the Duterte political family was actually an offshoot of three durable political dynasties. Uh, they're all related by affinity to the Duranos of Cebu, the Velosos of Leyte, and the Almendraces of Davao. So, but Vicente, the patriarch of the uh, 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 Duterte clan, no, was not a major player in the early years. Uh, he was simply a client to his more powerful, dominant relatives. But because of that, he was appointed as the governor of the undivided Davao province. Uh, now, if you look at the political map, there are several Davaos, no? Davao provinces. But uh, he was governor of the undivided Davao and later on uh, became close to Ferdinand Marcos and was appointed to the cabinet of uh, uh, Ferdinand Marcos as Secretary of General Services. And uh, Vicente was a staunch Marcos supporter. The wife, the mother of Rodrigo, Digong, you know, on the other hand, was a very active uh, street activist especially at the height of the Marcos dictatorship. 
when Nino Aquino was assassinated, Soledad Duterte organized all the anti Marcos pro Aquino rallies in Davao City. So the ma the father was a Marcos loyalist and the mother was a Dilawan. <laughs> so interesting, no? interesting. And uh and because of uh, uh, her active participation in the anti-Marcos struggle, uh, she was offered uh, by President Cory Aquino to become one of the officers in charge during the purge of all the pro-Marcos local government officials in 1986. She was offered the position of vice mayor of Davao. But she refused and instead offered the services of Rodrigo, okay, and uh, Rodrigo Duterte started, who was then a prosecutor, uh, then became OIC vice mayor, then ran for mayor mm -hmm. and won, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. huh? And the irony is that Duterte consolidated power in Davao City during the period of decentralization and democratization. And now, uh, there is a very influential <coughs> political family in Davao. Uh, some are saying that the daughter might succeed Rodrigo, Sara. And uh, you have Sara, who's currently mayor of Davao. Uh, the older brother, Paulo, who's now a congressman. And then the youngest, uh, uh, Sebastian or Baste, is now vice mayor. Dominant. Dormant. Well, <laughs> 10 more minutes. Okay. Uh, the Aquinos used to be one of the most durable. No? Uh, the patriarch was even a member of the 1898 Malolos Congress, the revolutionary. Uh, 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 legislature uh, at the height of the struggle against the, the Spaniards. Then later on he was arrested but also served in the uh, uh, early Philippine Assembly but uh, his son Benigno Sr. became uh, the more active uh, uh, patriarch of the clan who first served as a uh, uh, member of the Philippine Assembly, then later on he became speaker, then later on he was part, he collaborated with the Japanese sponsored government and still was active until the post-war. Then his son, Benigno Jr., became the youngest uh, mayor at the time, youngest governor and youngest senator and became the foil, the arch rival to Ferdinand Marcos. And when Marcos, uh, declared martial law, he was in exile, went home, assassinated, Cory Aquino became president, died, and Benigno III became president. But the story is that uh, while Noy Noy, or Benigno III, uh, was the popular president, his policies, when he was president, uh, was used by the supporters of Duterte no, to generate the politics of anger and this gave rise to uh, populism in the Philippines. So, and because of this strong uh, anti-Aquino, anti-yellow backlash, uh, the Aquino lost its mystique. No? The Aquino brand lost its mystique and for the first time since 1987, there is no sitting member of the Aquino family in national or local government. So if you look back at 2010 at the height of the Noi Noi fever, who would have thought that after six years, nobody would even touch the Aquino brand at this point in time. Huh? So the Aquino, family at this time, at this moment, has become dormant. Okay. Uh, the opposite of 
course, when you speak of an Aquino, there must be a Marcos. <laughs> That's the dichotomy of Philippine politics, no? the telenovela politics of the Philippines. No? Uh, Mariano Marcos, uh, the founder of the clan, was accused of assassinating a rival. Ferdinand Marcos was accused of pulling the trigger, defended himself eloquently, uh, used, became a guerrilla, became part of that generation of uh, uh, former guerrillas who entered post-war politics, became congressman, senator, senate president, eventually became president, declared martial law, was uh, overthrown in a people power uh, revolution for a brief period, went on exile. But slowly, surely, during the period of redemocratization, was able to consolidate and reconsolidate their power base, first at the local, and then slowly, until the pinnacle was, uh, of course, around 2016-2017, the burial of the father in the Heroes Cemetery. And now, uh, the son and namesake Ferdinand Jr. Uh, was elected to the Senate, almost became vice president, the sister, Aimee, has been elected to the Senate, and Imelda Rumbaldes Marcos has been elected several times at the House of Representatives, either as representative of Leyte or Ilocos Norte. <laughs> so they're, still, they're back. And, and they're, they are already preparing the next generation of Marcoses. Then you have the defunct. Uh, the Laurels, also very prominent uh, political family with the uh, Jose Senior, became president dur during the uh, Japanese sponsored republic. Uh, Jose Junior became speaker of the house, Salvador Laurel became vice president. Several Laurels ran in both the uh, Congress and uh, local positions in Batangas, but the last elected member of the Laurel clan, uh, Jose Laurel the sixth or the fifth, no? Uh, he was last elected in 2001, 1998 to 2001, and he's now, I think, the uh, ambassador, Philippine ambassador to Japan, and there, there are no Laurels in, in elected position. In fact, the next generation of Laurels have decided to leave politics. Uh, Peter Laurel and uh, Roberto Laurel. Peter Laurel was formerly Vice Governor Batangas, but they decided to concentrate on building the university that was established by their patriarch, the Lyceum uh, of the Philippines University. Peter Laurel is the president of Lyceum Batangas. Roberto Laurel is the president of Lyceum uh, Manila. And the next generation, their children, have all joined. Instead of following the family business, they, they decided to pursue the other family business, which is education. So they may be defunct in politics, but they have moved on to another field altogether, which is actually quite refreshing. If only no? others would follow suit. Okay, uh, for lack of time, uh, i just uh, uh, run through the uh, next set of slides. There, if, if you look at the literature, there are several uh, explanations why we have uh, dominance and persistence of dynasty. The sociocultural would look at the kinship networks as given the weakness of the party system, the family is, uh, is a ready, available, uh, organization for building your political machine, no? the extended uh, kinship ties and the fictive kinship ties. Then you have the more structural explanation. Uh, uh, different political dynasties or clans have uh, mastered adaptive strategies like the use of kinships, building of political machines, using wealth and property, or, their, or uh, raiding state resources, or if everything else fails, 
just like uh, the uh, Ampatuans of Maguindanao, they use political violence. No? And this is part of the entire captured deep state uh, framework uh, in which you have different particularistic interests being able to capture uh, state. And then, of course, weak institutions, no? uh, the 1987 constitution introduced term limits, but instead of stopping uh, the growth of dynasties, in fact, it accelerated uh, mm -hmm. because uh, once the politician is term limited, I think it's a Filipino term, term limited, uh, uh, they, pass, they pass on the position to their children, wife, parents, etc. No? So, uh, Professor Paul Hutchcroft and I have been proposing for the longest time institutional redesign. <coughs> no? So, uh, there is a need to push for political party party law no? as an initial block. And then some would say abolish term limits, but I think it's better because uh, uh, to maintain term limits and even pass an anti-dynasty law. Now, there are two schools of thought regarding regulation of dynasties. No? Uh, Professor Noel de Jos of the UP School of Economics and even uh, Professor Hutchcroft would say uh, the reason why uh, there are uh, dynasties is because of weak parties. No? So uh, their policy uh, proposal is to strengthen parties. Uh, so it's more on let the comp build the the the, the framework for competition such that the dynasties will eventually be absorbed by the parties. And then there's the other school of thought, which I've been pursuing, which is regulation. Uh, the dynasties have already controlled so much of Philippine political life that uh, there's a need to regulate them. And uh, uh, my argument is that the reason why uh, uh, political parties are weak is because dynasties are strong. So it's the opposite of the argument of Noel de Jos. Okay, wrap up. Uh, the Constitution, the 1987 Constitution, actually has a line. The state shall guarantee equal access to opportunities for public service and prohibit political dynasties as may be defined by law. Uh, the, original, the original formulation was that prohibit political dynasties, period. But there was a debate in the Constitutional Commission of 1985, and one of the commissioners, uh, Attorney Christian Monsod, insisted that a law <laughs> shall be passed by Congress. So, wow. So how can you expect a house of clans to pass a law banning dynasties? No? So it's like I always what I always say, it's like giving Dracula the key to the blood bank. No? So uh, there are several proposals, a uh, proposal to amend the constitution or even pass the law. And uh, part of the proposed regulation is that uh, there should be not an absolute ban, but a regulation of dynasties up to the second degree of consanguinity or affinity, uh, whether such relations are legitimate, illegitimate, half or full blood, either by succession or simultaneously holding public office. Of course, the day that we pass this is the day that I can finally retire from it all. So with that, thank you very much. Maraming yeah. salamat. Thank you very much, July. So let's open this up to uh, questions. Thanks. David. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's great to uh, speak of the political situation over there in the Philippines. Uh, as I learned uh, your, in your lecture, you talk about the new generations coming up, you know, all different uh, new generations. They still all belong to the major dynasties. 
and but still have a new ideas about uh, you know professionally trained at the university, also social using the social medias. Um, what well, just wondering where those new generation particularly belong to? You said that they have a four blood type A B C D. Where those new generation belong to the belong to uh, one of the A B C D? That's the one. And the second question is. If those if those maize dynasty uh, are very influential, uh, Paul mentioned about the political party reform. How did how do they play with the maize party? How do they uh, dynasty those different dynasty play with the political party? Are they dominant or are they standing together? Mm. Yeah. <coughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, of this five uh, sample of. Uh, uh, the next generation, uh, Biko Soto is type A. You know? uh, uh, his great grandfather was a very popular uh, a senator from Cebu. You know? The rest are all B. You know? uh, they've been, uh, they, their family emerged only uh, in the past four decades. You know? They became active in Philippine politics in the past four decades. So uh, one way of looking at it is that uh, Philippine political life and elections, there's a circulation you know, of political elites. But unfortunately, uh, the circulation is very narrow. So I always compare it to uh, the heart. You know, uh, when the pathways for the circulation of the blood is clogged by cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> Goes to show that aside from counting dynasties, I always I have also minded my diet. No? So uh, this uh, this dynasties act as a clog to the pathways to power. So uh, there's a need to remove no? uh, this uh, accumulation of bad cholesterol no, in the political life to become. So there is a circulation of elite but it is far and in between and usually once there is a new set of political elites, they start their own dynasty. Mm -hmm. So that has become uh, the norm. Did I answer yes, your question? Yes, yes. No, uh, the parties. Uh, yeah. Parties are so weak, <coughs> personality and patronage driven, that most of the parties are controlled by political families. Yes, sir, I, s I see your hand. Ah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. My turn. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, your, your talk um, um, was based on history, to that extent? Yes, sir. Yes, now you recognize me? Yes, my professor. <laughs> <laughs> You look so young. <laughs> what happened to you? I was, I My was, professor. I taught you history in 1984. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> now I remember my professor really well. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, no, I just noticed that uh, when you uh, talk about political history, uh, you start with 1901. Yes, sir. And, um, uh oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you can imagine what my question will be. Yes, sir. But, um, uh, you know, obviously, we uh, the Philippines has been around for hundreds of years yes. before that. Um, is it possible that some of the problems we have in analyzing political phenomena in the Philippines today, or in recent, in the last hundred years, is because we haven't come to grips with our real political heritage, mm. the 300 years of science? Yep. So, well, there was politics then. Yes. And we mustn't forget that when, when in 1570 uh, yes. treaties were made, the pactos de sangre between uh, Legazpi and Tibai's chief, yes. uh, the Spanish king promised to uh, uphold or recognize or uh, respect indigenous uh, yes. values. Yes. And so the status of the, the tattoo yes. or the raja was kept intact. Yes. And it morphed into the mayor. Yep. The governor Rosilio, the Capitan Municipal, Presidente, the different ways of calling them. So uh, my uh, suggestion, and I'm not making any critical remarks, I'm just suggesting that perhaps we should incorporate into uh, analysis of yes. contemporary politics 
Of course, the uh, the kind of politics we had is a municipal level, yes. which is uh, what I've been looking at. Yes. And I noticed, for example, that in in a, in a typical town, there was all this, you know, uh, the the mayorship would be shared between families. Yes. But the parish priest was there, the Spanish priest was yes. there, to kind of act as some kind of a referee. Yes. And also to make sure that certain values, certain moral values, were upheld. Yes. And so you also been looking at the qualities of successful mayors, yes. their ability to control, to run the local police and yes. to keep the towns free of bandit attacks. Mm. That, that, uh, that tradition uh, is mm. still ex exists today, I except we have, a, we have a problem in the, uh, yes. you know, in the uh, translation of that municipal experience to the national. Yes. And, and, and because of the sudden break yes. between the Spanish and American periods, yes. we are still actually, we have inherited the whole vocabulary of American politics. Even the word, you yes, of course. About dynasty, I, I, I you understand. talk about yes. Uh, yes. All, all sorts of terms which, yes. uh, if you were coming from a different civilization or culture, you, yes. you wouldn't be using them. Of course. You would try to look for something that would be most, something about Philippine history and traditions that would more naturally lead to a, a modern politics that makes sense to the majority of the population. That might explain why there's 80% mm. approval rate for this president while the intellectuals like, mm. you know, uh, Ateneo, you mm. describe uh, so, uh, are all kind of <laughs> critical of Duterte, but of course. the public sees something in it. Thank you, sir. Because of yes. something inarticulated, you know, yes. not, not articulated, but it's, it's something that they're familiar with at the local level, which they see at the national. Wow. And I just yes. uh, kind of Thank you very history. much, sir. Uh, talk about the major throwback Tuesday, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I feel so young again. <laughs> <laughs> this was the same kind of conversation we had in 1984. <laughs> so, but thank you, sir. Yes, I am well aware of the gap, big gap in the literature. Uh, I'm happy that uh, you are looking back at that experience of uh, local politics during the Spanish colonial period. Not much have been written except for a handful of historians like Obi Corpus and Teodoro Agoncillo and uh, Renato Constantino. But not many have actually looked into the details of uh, the attempt at or the kind of local politics they had in the 400 years of Spanish colonial rule. There have been attempts at describing uh, local politics during the American colonial period, and there have been uh, quite a number of studies. There was this uh, uh, volume uh, on uh, Philippine colonial democracy published by the Ateneo in the late 80s, but, and then of course, uh, Professor Paul Hutchcroft has been studying uh, local national uh, dynamics no? uh, from the very beginning. But yeah, I think, sir, yes, uh, but uh, my work is already so much studying <laughs> the dynasties of the day, so we just have to look for the next generation of scholars to <laughs> do that. Yes, sir. Here, here, here. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for your thank talk. You. Um, I was wondering whether or not you can elaborate a little bit on whether or not dynastic politicians act differently across your categories at different points in time. Are dynastic politicians simply mm -hmm. dynastic politicians, or do these categories uh, lead them to act in different ways, uh, particularly with respect to their pursuit of political outcomes. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, one way of answering that is going back to my uh, doctoral dissertation when the Philippine Constitution 1987 introduced term limits. So uh, those elected in Congress or in the uh, uh, provincial local government are given only three <coughs> terms of three years each. So uh, uh, of course, this accelerated the uh, uh, the rise of the next generation, and uh, the mood back then was that ah, they're young, they must act differently. But uh, that was 1998. We're already in 2019. Most of the first batch of young generation politicians emerged in 1998 have all turned out to be the same as their parents. So. In the beginning, they projected that they were the next generation, but eventually they started playing the game. So 
I think the problem is still institutional, structural, uh, unless we try to change the rules of the game and the incentives for political competition, then uh, we will be stuck with the same. So even if there's a new next generation of uh, young politicians, they will be eaten up by the system. Quick follow-up. Yes. Do dynastic politicians act differently from non-dynastic politicians? Uh, they behave the same. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 <laughs> well, not <laughs> It's called no, ka. 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 <laughs> hard to say. Uh, she was very close to the previous administration, was able mm. to generate enough political resource mm. to be able to combat uh, the dynasty okay. you know, because of her links with the past administration. Mm. So that's the key to her success. Okay. The same way that uh, the Rocamoras. Mm. Uh, in Siki Hor, did the same. Mm. Yeah, Lisa, thanks. Lisa, yes. Yes. Hi. Great to have you here. Yes, thank you. So I have a clarification also yes. based on what you were saying about uh, regulating the dynasty. Yes. So I was thinking, is it, is it, a, I was going to, just to clarify, is it a matter of putting the dynasties on a diet to make them change again? Mm. Mm. Instead of the cat dynasty that you were describing earlier? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, well, of course, uh, some would prefer a total ban, you know, but of course, uh, the reality of politics in the Philippines, you cannot even pass that law or constitutional amendment <coughs> if you don't uh, agree to compromise with the political families. Mm -hmm. And some of them are enlightened enough to be willing to go on a diet. <laughs> from fat to thin. But there are those who are saying, no, it's the other way around. You should allow the thin uh, the fat dynasties, and for them, their interpretation of dynasty is uh, succession, mm -hmm. not the multiple holding of position. But actually, the more uh, detrimental to the political life of the nation is the fat dynasty. Yeah, sorry, I have a, a question. Yes, yes. With regards to the historical analysis, mm -hmm. so would you say that, for instance, in Mindanao, when yes. you have specific history, you have a very um, different from the rest of the Philippines, mm. would the dynasties be qualitatively different? Yes. Uh, in fact, that has become the core of contention, one of the main co uh, center of contention in the recently passed Bangsamoro Organic Law, and that's the reason why they removed the anti-dynasty provision. Because, uh, of course, they're arguing from a cultural perspective that uh, it's part of the culture of Mindanao. But, I don't know. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go to Paul yes. next. Um, thanks very much. Uh, so, I'm, I'm thinking of Tenshan Chandra's book, mm -hmm. Tenshan Chandra and Moyu, she, she mm -hmm. wrote a book on uh, dynastic politics in India. India. Yeah. Uh, and sort of one of the things that come out of that is that dynasties are sort of neither good nor bad. Mm -hmm. It just basically depends on context, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in some contexts, dynasties can actually function as a, a sort of substitute for parties. Yes. Because if parties yes. are effectively brand names, yes. people can identify with yeah. good or bad governance, they can mm -hmm. get punished. So dynasties are only going to stay in power so long mm -hmm. as they continue to deliver right. what they're supposed to deliver. Right. Um, and if they don't, then you just turf them out. Mm -hmm. um, and replace them with another dynasty, right. which again substitutes for a party. So, you know, in this context where there's no sort of fundamental reform to how patronage works and political power works in the Philippines, is simply just taking out this sort of surface layer of right. dynasties, even cutting them back to thin yeah. uh, rather than fat. Is that actually going to make a difference to how Philippine politics works? Yeah. Well, I've been wrestling with that question for the longest time. And, uh, of course, part of the solution might be uh, Professor Iletos looking for a more uh, contextualized view of politics beyond uh, what we see in the literature. Uh, hmm. But so far, and I've worked with uh, Paul on this, uh, the idea really is to build 
or give the incentive to build political parties such that families, instead of lording it over their constituencies, would enter the context of party competition. And from within the context of party competition, whether they are part of a political family or not, uh, they will compete instead of just you know, uh, arbitrarily uh, dominating local politics. That's one. The second is true because of the lack of programmatic politics in the Philippines. Uh, political families have become a uh, substitute for brand default in the world. So that's another dimension to it. So uh, this guy has promised not to build a dynasty. So I hope he, <laughs> he keeps his promise. So, uh, <laughs> Bernard, and then Maria next. Yes. So, um, I actually have a couple of questions with yes. the indulgence. Um, one is on, on the historical analysis of certain mm -hmm. methodology. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that a huge part of sort of maintaining political dynasties in this country relies on certain marriages yes. within political clans. Yes. Um, how did you sort of factor that in within sort of your broader methodology? Yes. And if so, like, were they significant in terms of them shifting across the different types of yeah. dynasties that you mentioned? So uh, I've identified the adaptive strategies uh, <coughs> part of kinship mm -hmm. and part of this entire. So uh, uh, there's a lot of inter-clan uh, alliances, usually through marriages. No? Of course, mm -hmm. uh, Juanco Aquino is one, Marcos Romualdez, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Uh, in recent times, uh, it's not just political pedigree, but also showbiz pedigree. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes. uh, politicians of uh, old political pedigree would marry uh, uh, showbiz personalities. Yes, the next question? Yeah, yeah. The Very next short. Question. Yeah. Um, and and this, is, this will be a bit controversial due to the nature of the talk, but um, the normal set of approach to appreciating political dynasties is that it's something that you should sort of remove, right? Mm. Um, that's sort of the, the, the dominant frame that we're using. Um, I'm trying to sort of write above that and ask, is the, the problem with sort of traditional <coughs> politics a question of accountability or representation? Meaning mm -hmm. that regardless of whether or not it's political dynasty or not, um, are they in fact whoever's sitting there accountable to the people? Is that the bigger issue? Or um, in the process of removing dynasties, do we actually do anything or increase accountability as well? Mm. Well, in an ideal world, that would be true. But if you, if, if you have observed Philippine politics as closely as Paul and I have, wishful thinking. <laughs> so uh, the answer is simple. You must have representation and accountability. You cannot separate them. If you have one over the other, you still have a problem. Uh, next, Maria, but I'll throw in a quick comment here. Uh, uh, Yolanda Jost, uh, uh, the uh, uh, political economist uh, and economist that uh, uh, July has mentioned, has highlighted the Philippines' politics is not broke uh, because parties are strong. Parties are strong because the Philippine politics is, is broke. Maria? Thank you. Um, it was a very interesting presentation, and I learned a lot. I think I also have two questions. I think the first one is the gender question, mm -hmm. um, and which goes into the and how strategic the inclusion of women in politics contribute to stability or instability of these dynasties, mm -hmm. which I think would be very um, revealing. And it gives that historical, long historical perspective to going back to post uh, pre-colonial era where you know there's this notion of how women's status have changed drastically because of the colonial imposition. My second question is um, whether challenging you to <laughs> also, and you know you have a lot to do already in this project, but also <laughs> globalizing it. Um, I was really struck by, by your visual on the trend that in 17, uh, uh, in, in, in 2047, we've got 70% dynasties. Now I wonder whether we're focusing on, um, in focusing on this continuity, that we haven't theorized about the rupture. And I'm really interested in, um, the new generation that you've um, portrayed, and 
I think many analysts have already pointed out how the current polarized local politics, you know, with Duterte in power and the, you know, either DDS or Dilawan, is actually maybe creating an opposite um, sort of politics, which is, you know, really, you know, removed from all of this polarization. And you see that, I guess, I hope in the U.S. where you have these progressive, um, you know, women leaders who have mm. rose, risen to power precisely <coughs> because of the environment that yeah. Trump has created. I wonder whether we are seeing hopefully something like that in the Philippines, just because this politics at the moment is so toxic, maybe it might shape a new rupture that opens for even more progressive politicians. Okay, uh, the first question about uh, uh, the gender. Uh, <coughs> yes, that's an interesting part, and I've seen in some of the case, cases I've looked into, uh, women do offer a different kind or style of governance no, compared to uh, the uh, men in the political family. And, but of course, uh, uh, that aspect of a study of uh, political families, uh, I'm not the one doing that, but my uh, constant writing partner, uh, Professor Mark Thompson of the City University of Hong Kong, has done quite a number of uh, studies regarding uh, uh, women dynasties, no? and she even had she coined uh, he coined he coined a term presidentas, no? the women president of Asia. So uh, I will refer you to Mark Thompson. And then the second one, comparative. Yes, I've done comparative work. I've looked at the Japanese case, or what they call the seshugin. No? Uh, uh, Japan has the Nisei, Sansei, Yonsei generation, and. Uh, uh, Japan, Japanese uh, politics is excited right now because of the rise and emergence of the son of Julie Churi Koizumi, uh, former Prime Minister of Japan, who's a third generation uh, Sansei politician who is touted to be a future Prime Minister of Japan. I've also looked into uh, the case of the United States. Uh, they went through a period of, similar to the Philippines, uh, large number of dynasties in the Congress, but eventually diminished, but they still have a large number of political families existing at the state uh, legislature and state level. So uh, I've also looked at the other cases. I would like to look at India eventually. <laughs> so, uh, Also, just very uh, short uh, question. So my question is really about whether you see some uh, community uh, responses or community-based form of regulation given the difficulty in really introducing these institutional and structural yes. reforms? Yes. <laughs> Again, there's a silver lining because the political families and dynasties allowed a law to be passed uh, regulating dynasty, but only in the Sangguniang Kabataan elections. <laughs> this is the youth representative in the local council. So <laughs> they allowed anti-dynasty provision to be passed for the Sangguniang Kabataan. So that's a beginning, mm -hmm. perhaps. No? So, but it's still a long way to go. So, I want to ask a question. Um, with the, the dynasties, I presume the, the families have got used to, you know, assuming that one of them is going to be the next generation leader. What about their control of the and influence over the economy? Does that mm. does that drive them to make sure that they are the one, the dynasty that's in in, uh, in office, or or is the internationalisation of the economy, however it's touched, it's sort of been kind of broken that down again? Yes. Uh, Yes, the political economy dimension of dynastic building is very important. In fact, uh, John Seidel wrote a lot about it. And uh, uh, in fact, the outbreak of violence, uh, the uh, uh, monopoly of local power uh, for Seidel, uh, he points to the political economy, the control. So from the landed <coughs> elite to the uh, more commercially based families, no, uh, uh, Another professor of mine at the University of the Philippines, Temario Rivera, uh, took note of the uh, transition of landlords to capitalists by 
combining both the aspect of being landlords and being capitalists, and they were able to utilize this to consolidate political power. So it's worth mentioning that the three uh, durable political parties in existence in the Philippines are all controlled by big business interests. All the other uh, parties are like mushroom parties. They come and go. But the three uh, most durable parties that are competitive enough and have organizational uh, uh, continuity since 1987 uh, are all controlled by oligarchs. I was wondering if there, if you found any convergence between the persistence of dynasties and how they're affected by the war on drugs. <laughs> because that, that would be interesting. Uh, would Lara be interesting. had already done some Pancho. work, Pancho Lara, had yeah. done some work on some dynasties in Mindanao, yeah. uh, linking uh, the expansion of the Ampatu ones. Uh, that uh, who's uh, the the, ma the the father became governor, uh, uh, but from their initial control of uh, uh, Maguindanao, they were able to expand to other areas by linking up with other political dynasties uh, in other parts of the Bangsamoro. Uh, but they did so because they wanted to control not just primarily the state resources which they got through Aquino, but control over the illicit economy uh, that was persistent over Bangsamora area. So I was wondering if the war on drugs by Duterte had targeted some of the the clans uh, and, and what happened to them as a consequence. I'm sorry, no. I have not looked into that yet. Mm -hmm. So it's a topic that we should uh, assign to a doctoral student. <laughs> 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 But it's an interesting uh, uh, dimension of dynasticism mm -hmm. and uh, populism and mm -hmm. the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. That's a paper waiting to be written. Uh, yeah. And indeed, with ten mayors killed, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it's something yeah. to watch. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Not yeah. not necessarily by the same perpetrators, but ten mayors killed uh, is is <laughs> quite a remarkable number. Yes. Since 2016. 2016. Um, so uh, yes, please, Cleve. Cleve. Yeah. So my, my um, question is on the defunct uh, dynasties. Mm -hmm. um, you, you did mention that there are only a um, few number of cases in, the, in this category. But what were the reasons uh, why um, they are in the, uh, they're already defunct? The issue all is that they've been defeated by a much stronger dynasty. dynasty. Mm -hmm. So uh, political Darwinism. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's, that's the main that reason. The, uh, the other is because uh, the other reason is much more interesting, <coughs> like the laurels. Yeah. Uh, the next generation just simply gave up. That leads into a question I'll, I'll uh, throw in here. Uh, and, and that is, I'm wondering whether you, you might need a, another category, a yes. category E for, say, mm -hmm. the the Lopez clan that has been very active uh, yeah. directly, yeah. electorally in the yes. past uh, with uh, vice president in the early 1950s, but uh, moved into business interests and uh, in the post Marcos years after they had been in exile and mm -hmm. lost a lot of their property, they didn't bother to go into politics directly themselves, but mm -hmm. they had a surrogate who was watching over them, uh, mm. Sir Jasmania, mm. uh, an in-law that, mm. that sort of took care of their right. their interests for them, and and right. other cases in which um, those who move from local dynasties to national oligarchy mm. uh, have made a, a decision to allow others to mm. uh, do their bidding in the same way that many um, uh, Chinese um, uh, families and major mm. Spanish oligarchs will. Uh, not bother to get into politics mm. directly. They know they don't have many electoral mm. prospects, but they'll have uh, someone else uh, uh, involved. So that's that's my first question. Uh, th the second is um, if um, families exist in all political systems and um, uh, dynasties are not per se the uh, problem in the Philippines, but rather the institutions within which they operate, and if the chances of an anti-dynasty law or are zero to nil, um, 
why even bother to push it? And why not instead uh, work towards the, the strengthening of the institutional context? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So first category E and then for the Yeah, then. Uh, well, for category E, I, I included them in the either uh, 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 C <coughs> or D. Dormant or defunct. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, for example, uh, yeah, the, the Orioles have decided to to uh, diversify. Uh, the Lopez's are, in fact, part of the durable. They've been there since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but now they are more or less defunct. No? There are no, there's still some Lopez at, at the local level. Yeah. In Iloilo, Guimaras. Distant, distant relatives, right. Yeah. Cause the yeah. But not the, the main, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Lopez's, yeah. the Lopez uh, oligarchy is in a much deeper problem now under Duterte, mm -hmm. as we all know, because the uh, prospect of uh, their franchise of the biggest uh, media network is under question whether uh, it will be approved or not. Mm -hmm. So they have a bigger problem than politics, and well, it's yeah. still politics, mm -hmm. but than electoral mm -hmm. politics. Right, right. The second one is... Uh, Why even bother with an anti-dynasty law if uh, the, uh, one, it doesn't have a chance, and two, uh, the issue isn't dynasties per se, but the context within, within well, which they yeah, operate. Well, it's both. You push for the institutional reforms, but at the same time, do not lose sight of the bigger uh, goal, which is to pass a regulation. And who knows, in due time, uh, uh, from time to time, you get the uh, Black Swan event, uh, major rupture, uh, Nisco Moreno, who eventually might be able to push it. Um, uh, well, we're going for a uh, second round here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, please, Liam. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just interested in some quick comments of the role that presidential administrations play in all this, because mm -hmm. uh, in the, can you think of some examples of, say, an interruption in dynastic power at the local level that has been caused by one of these dynasties sort of earning the disfavor of a president or an administration or <laughs> national elites, whatever. Um, or is the, is the, have I got the balance of power wrong there? Uh, well, of course, the, the fulcrum of power is still uh, with the president. No? Uh, mm -hmm. We have a very strong presidency within a weak state. And one good case would be uh, just recently, uh, President Duterte uh, used his uh, influence to bring down um, mayor of a traditional political family, Mayor Osmeña. Uh, so, uh, and Osmeña is like a Duterte, mini Duterte, in terms of his political style. But, uh, you know, it's a battle between two machos, alpha male. <laughs> And Duterte won that fight. Uh, another century-old dynasty on the on the skids. Yes. As well. Yeah. Right. And there's no Osmania right now in power. I think. No, yeah. that's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. David. Oh, because time goes quick. Simply, <coughs> just uh, yeah. Let's question. take two in a row here, yeah. and then. Oh, yep. please. Yep. Simple question. The current president, uh, he's very famous. Where he belongs to which dynasty? And during this time, his time. Does he do any political or invisible uh, press uh, to uh, other dynasties? Okay. Uh, nominally, he is uh, he belongs to a traditional family, but his political dynasty uh, really emerged only during uh, the past four decades, uh, particularly actually more two decades, pa nga, two decades or three decades. Eh? So. Uh, on record, he is against dynasties, despite the fact that <laughs> he built one. And uh, for him, it's the people's choice, it, which is the usual uh, argument of uh, members of political dynasty. It's a democracy, it's people's choice. But uh, the point here is uh, mm. uh, the advantage of the position. Uh, uh, that's actually, and of course, that's accountability. So uh, he brought, he also helped bring down uh, the Eusebios of uh, Fasi by endorsing the candidacy of the young Vicos Lopez. So he can go against uh, rival dynasties and, and still maintain the others. And the same, can, the same pattern 
can be observed in previous presidencies, no? Ibn Noynoy, Ibn Loya. So if you're if you're part of my coalition, you're not a dynasty, you're a political legacy. But if you're my enemy, you're a dynasty. Last very quick question from Cleek. Yes. I was I was also wondering whether um it would be analytically like meaningful to introduce the category of those dynasties who moved from one place to another. I mean yeah. Um I mean we've we've had a case of um like the Chagasu. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, who 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 uh, tried to occupy new um, places, but also like uh, maybe like the case of um, Kowangkos who moved out of totally moved out of Tarlac to Negros. They have Pangasinan and yeah, Bacolod yeah, and, and Tarlac, yeah. and but now they're all, they're back in Tarlac. In Tarlac. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Uh, it's a work in progress. Actually, this emerged from an original typology that I use in my dissertation, which classified clans into traditional, new, emerging. But I tried to update it to a more uh, uh, so dormant, durable. But yeah, eventually. Let's talk about it over beer. <laughs> All, right. All right, very good. Well, that's a, that's a good place to end. And please join me yes. in thanking Jill.